Hello, I'm Anthony. Today I want to have a conversation about the process of being a musician. And it's really two separate conversations we're going to have today very closely related. The physical process of training our bodies to do this pretty bizarre thing, but also the mental aspect, the intellectual um, aspect of learning, of studying. Both of those things are difficult. They're very time consuming. Being a musician is tough. So how much time are you supposed to spend on those disciplines. Now I'm coming at this conversation from a specific angle. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it recently because I've just come off a couple of months of intense love and practice and passion for the acoustic guitar, playing it every day, writing songs on it, just really enjoying that process. And I turn around and suddenly I've not played for the past 10 days. It might even be a couple of weeks now where I've not picked uh, the guitar up at all. And I can already feel my fingers starting to soften and that inertia is starting to build. And when I get to this stage, I very often get down on myself. It's like, oh, you've not, you've not failed again, have you? These constant challenges that, that I'm kind of presenting to myself, I'm going to play the guitar every day. And the moment that fails, I feel bad. So I want to break this stuff down and kind of dissect it in my kind of usual analytical way to see if there's any kind of help that I can give myself so that when I inevitably fall off any of the many wagons that I need to be on in order to be a musician, I don't feel quite so bad about it. Let's split it into two sections, the intellectual side and the physical side. I'll deal with the, the intellectual side of being a musician first. And we're going to start with music theory, the process of learning new skills and information that's been accumulated over the past four or 500 years. I have an example on screen of the kind of thing that um, illustrates the point pretty well. What you're seeing there is a sequence of secondary dominants. We have an imaginary piece of music in the key of C major. As far as the piano is concerned, the simplest of all keys, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Couldn't possibly be easier. But this chord sequence that you can see on screen has two notes that aren't in the key of C major. We have an A sharp up here and we have an F sharp. I'll play this sequence. All of the notes sound good. That's the idea of secondary dominance. So what's going on? Well, we've got three major chords. There's F major, G major, and C major. And the concept of secondary dominance states that any chord that you're going to play can be transposed up by a perfect fifth, which is seven semitones, and you play a dominant seventh chord before you play your major chord. So if I'm gonna play an F major chord here, I can precede that with a C dominant seven. Those four notes there generate a C dominant seventh chord. And it sounds awesome. It just sounds great. That's a fact that you can learn. You can study the concept of secondary dominance, learn how to apply them to songwriting and use them in your own songs. And now I have extra flavor. Instead of the seven diatonic notes of the C major scale, I've got extra fruity notes this A sharp and this F sharp, which have no place in the key of C major at all, function superbly in this particular context. And there are very good reasons for it as well. It's not a complete accident that this stuff works. I'm not gonna learn from first principles that that can be done, probably not in my lifetime anyway. I might accidentally stumble across it at one point, but I don't need to because I can read a book somebody else has already figured it out and they're basically just giving me this tool that I almost certainly wouldn't have discovered on my own. And there are a huge number of these gems of information sat there in the music theory books that you can learn and then apply to your own songwriting. Now, nobody's saying, I'm certainly not saying that you need to get this from a book. Another perfectly reasonable way to do it is to listen to other people. The most famous example of a group of musicians who didn't know any music theory, at least at the beginning, was the Beatles. They learned their music from transcribing other people's songs and learning tricks and techniques. Obviously, later on in their career, they expanded their knowledge significantly, but at the beginning, it was all just learning other people's stuff, standing on the shoulders of giants. You can do it from a book or you can do it with your ear. They're both perfectly reasonable. Now, I'm naturally inclined to learn this stuff from books. I much prefer to read music theory books, write all of that down, and then practice writing my own songs with that information. That's just my own personal choice. But every now and again, I do dip in 
to a, a song that I'm particularly fond of and figure out how it works. And I did that a couple of months ago. It actually, as it happens, was a Beatles song. Um, and the progression was one from in my life. I was listening to the song and the chord sequence went from a D major down to a D minor and then down to the root of the, of the song, which is A major. That D major has no place in the key. It's a parallel chord. Now, I'm pretty sure that in 1965, none of the Beatles knew what a parallel chord was. Maybe they did. Maybe I'm doing them wrong. But the fact is that they will have done that intuitively. I picked it up by learning those chords and thinking that's absolutely gorgeous. And in the very next song that I wrote, I used, it was in a different key, but that three chord progression in a completely different context, I'm just borrowing a musical idea rather than stealing a musical phrase from a specific song. So intellectual study, be it from either books or using your ear, gives you a toolbox of skills and that's going to have two very distinct benefits. One, you've got a greater palette of musical choice to play with. The second benefit, particularly from the ear training or transcribing approach, is that every time you do it, you get better at it. Now, I'm very bad at it. It takes me ages to learn chords from a song. And sometimes I'll cheat. I'll go online and actually figure out what the chords are. But you are really supposed to, if you really want to kind of squeeze the most value out of ear training, you are really supposed to use your ears and actually figure it out from first principles. And what that's doing really then is training your brain to identify individual intervals. And the faster and better you get at that, the faster and better you are at learning other people's music. So I haven't just convinced myself that I'm supposed to do all of this stuff. Do I? Not, not very much. I, I very rarely actually sit down and learn a piece of music by ear because it's so hard and I never got to the point where I could do it sufficiently quickly that I wasn't frustrated. So that kind of dragging yourself through mud at the outset of any difficult intellectual endeavor, never really got through that. Would it behoove me to do so? Absolutely. I can very clearly see the benefits of transcribing. Every time I do it, I learn something new. It's very rare that you transcribe a complete song unless it's some you know, very trite pop song and you don't learn something. There isn't a, a little snippet of good stuff that you can drag out of it, but it's really difficult and I don't find it very much fun. I obviously would if I got better at it, but I don't find it enough fun to make me want to keep coming back to that well. What I've discovered is that I can use alternative learning mechanisms to kind of paper over those cracks whether that's looking up chord tracks online or watching videos on YouTube. I'm a member of um, Scott's Bass Lessons, uh, which is a, a really fabulous resource for musicians. I know obviously it's very heavily focused on the bass guitar, but you do also learn an awesome amount of theory from that perspective. So I prefer to sit and be taught something by somebody and then go away and practice that stuff myself. And I don't feel bad about that. I could never be a participant in a jazz ensemble because I can't pick up what other thing what other people are doing fast enough, but I've got absolutely no interest in playing live, so I don't care. One very quick thing I want to address from the technical perspective, from the intellectual perspective, every now and again you'll come across people making the argument, you don't want to learn too much because it'll paint you into a corner, it'll box you in with your kind of mental approach to music. Generally speaking, I think that's complete nonsense. The only time that actually becomes true is if you use that theory to write all of your music and you never allow any kind of natural creativity to come across. And one thing that I do to guard against that, particularly this helps on the, on the acoustic guitar, which is where I tend to be more performance based. When I'm starting to write a song on the acoustic guitar, I won't use any theory at all. I don't particularly look at where my fingers are landing on the fretboard. I'll play it until I hear something interesting and then I'll intellectually parse what I've played to find out whether it's in a single key. Is it using theory concepts that I understand and can identify and then I can kind of then use that to tailor the next part of the song or, or embellish it in some way. But I tend to find that right at the very beginning, abandoning all theory completely and just closing your eyes and letting notes come out is a really good way not to paint yourself into a corner. It's important to reiterate, though, that the idea of learning too much theory is, I think, a complete nonsense. I, I've never understood 
Well, I think it it must come from a perspective of frustration and jealousy because it just doesn't make any sense at all. Now then, what about intellectual aids? We have a program here called Scalar, which is going to do some MIDI mapping for me. So let's say this piece of music is in D flat instead. Say C sharp and Cubase, but it's D flat major. What I'm going to do now is transform all of the white keys on my keyboard to play in the key of C major. So I'm going to play all of the white keys. Mouse is hovering over D sharp there. Okay, that makes it incredibly easy for me to play C major, an otherwise challenging scale. No way I could play that fast. I can play the white keys pretty quickly, but the moment you introduce black keys, kind of fall to pieces. So if I'm writing a, a song in the, the key, in the key of C major, am I supposed to use a tool like Scalar? Well, maybe. I can certainly play all the chords nice and quickly because I'm just playing white, white keys. But what happens if I want to use the secondary dominants that are printed on screen? There are a couple of notes here, the B and the G, that are no longer accessible to me because they're not mapped to those white keys. We jump over them in the, transf in the transformation. Now I could map Scalar to say, you know, use the black keys to play these, these unusual notes, the exotic notes. At that point, am I gaining anything from the tool? Because suddenly I have to remember where those mapped notes are. It's actually very difficult, it's counterintuitive to look at a C on the keyboard, play it, and not hear a C. Playing a C sharp there when I hit the white key. Is this tool useful to me? I'm actually in two minds at the moment because I'm starting to find it's restricting my creativity. The moment I transform my keyboard into white keys only, I only play notes from the diatonic scale that I'm mapped to. And that means I don't get to do the fruity stuff like I did with that um, D major to D minor progression, the parallel chord in the other song, or secondary dominance or tritone substitutions or any of the other really lovely musical concepts that we can use to borrow notes from other scales. So the TLDR, as far as aids like this are concerned, is buyer beware. It might seem like a great thing. And two years ago, I wrote all of my music using Scalar. And that meant that all of the music that I wrote was strictly in the diatonic key that I was playing at the time. Having not tied myself quite so slavishly to Scalar in recent times, I'm starting to find that I'm able to be more expressive. I'm able to find notes from other keys, play little chromatic progressions that might not have been available to me or I wouldn't have even thought about them because I'd basically just taken those ideas off the table. I'm starting to think maybe I shouldn't be using this tool at all. That would then teach me to learn those intervallic gaps, the periods of the spaces on the keyboard where I'm supposed to be playing. If you use white keys only, those intervals are actually obscured. And where I think I'm playing a major third, I might be playing a minor third because all of the intervals have been messed with. But as I said at the beginning of this video, the aspect um, of musical learning that I'm struggling most with at the moment is physical. To the extent that I'm very often disappointed with myself for having failed to maintain some sort of regime. I've just come out of this period where I've been playing lots of acoustic guitar and absolutely loving that. But now that I've stopped and I want to do something else, I'm in this difficult limbo situation of watching my fingers soften. You feel this kind of increasing inertia. It gets harder and harder to actually escape the cycle because the longer I go, the softer the fingers get. When I pick the guitar up, it's going to hurt more to start playing with, which is in itself is a disincentive for playing. And so you play less. But every time I try to make myself play the guitar every day, then it becomes a chore. And as soon as something's a chore, I don't want to do it anymore. So how am I supposed to get around that? Well, I actually don't know. That's why I'm making this video now with soft fingers. <laughs> These calluses are nearly gone. It only takes a couple of weeks for them to start disappearing enough for it to be uncomfortable picking the guitar up again. And I'm back in this situation where it's like, God damn, this has happened again. Now, I think this time around, the way I'm actually going to solve it is to go back to the electric guitar and try and just kind of kickstart myself into a new interest. Probably not picked up the electric guitar for over a year at this point. I've been writing lots of electronic music and that's been awesome. But now that the acoustic guitar is spinning down, 
I need something else to carry on to maintain that physical dexterity. Because if you're engaged in a physical activity, particularly something like playing the guitar, where it, it is actually painful to play if you leave it too long, I think you do have to maintain some sort of plate spinning. You know, you get the, the plate spinning on the little stick. I think you've really got to kind of maintain that all the time. And I struggle with that. And the making of this video is my kind of public declaration of intent to try harder because I've allowed laziness, the, the fact that I don't particularly want to do it, so I don't do it. And it's really easy to say, well, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Well, that's not good enough, is it? Because now I've got soft fingers. So when I want to do it, I'm going to be disincentivized from doing so. So I need a policy. I'm actually going to instruct myself from this point onwards to play the guitar for an absolute minimum of five minutes a day, just five minutes. I think that's enough to actually maintain calluses. And it's so short, it's so short a period of time that it's absolutely nothing in the day. But this is the first time I've ever imposed a physical regime on myself where I'm actually required to play every day. And if I, if I do that, I think I can, I'm pretty good at sticking to stuff if I decide to have the, the, the absolute determination to do that thing. What I'm hoping, and I'll make a follow-up video at some point in the future when I find out whether or not this has actually worked, is that just the process of picking it up in order to satisfy this mandatory requirement, this now kind of life law that I'm imposing upon myself, whether or not that helps me to maintain an interest because once you've picked it up, you know, then maybe you just want to kind of jam away and have some fun. But if I'm not feeling particularly in the mood that day, then maybe you let it slip and it only takes three or four of those to eat, to start getting the spiral going and then you're away. Then you, you, you've, you've gone, you've lost it. And that's what's happened to me over the past couple of weeks. Good intentions every day. I keep looking at the guitar and thinking, I'll pick it up at some point, but I'm just busy right now. Must do better. I'm giving myself a D minus on what's happened in the past couple of weeks. And I'm going to try and brush myself back up to get back to the point where I'm at least not physically impeded from playing. And then if I actually want to, that's fine. But I'm basically going to pay a five minute subscription. I'm, I'm subscribing to the guitar and that's going to cost me five minutes a day. And that will entitle me to play it whenever I want. Hopefully that'll be enough. We'll see. Beyond the physical requirements of tough fingers and calluses, is there a need to actually gain technical chops? Well, I think the answer is exactly the same as when I was talking about intellectual learning earlier. The more physical chops you've got, the greater your palette of choice when you come to write that song. If you want to do a fast lick, if you've got the ability to do it, you can do it. Very often I fail at that stage. My technical skill on the guitar is average at best. And so if I want to play a fast lick, I simply can't. I either have to piece it together in Cubase by cheating or write something else. I don't play other people's music, so I don't have to worry. The title of my YouTube channel isn't a mistake. You know, it's, it's not, it wasn't an accident that I called it One Man and His Songs because I don't play with other musicians. So I don't need the physical ability to listen to a cue from a drummer or a, a fellow guitarist. All I need is to be able to play well enough to be able to write the songs that I write. And I find that I can pretty much do that as long as I don't let these get too soft. So I'm making that a priority. I'm raising that on my priority list. Note to self, five minutes a day from this point onwards. It's been a while since I've imposed mandatory training on myself. Let's see how it goes. Hope you enjoyed this one today. Please hit like if you did. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you again. Thanks very much.